I want to talk about AFC Bournemouth because AFC Bournemouth haven't haven't lost a game in the Premier League since the 9-0 defeat that we referenced just before uh, against Liverpool. They're currently 10th uh, in the top half and uh, we thought it was high time to talk about those cherries and to do that with us now is the Athletics Bournemouth reporter Ahmed Shubal. Hi Ahmed. Hey Joe, hey guys, how you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Just recovering from a cold, but other than that, all oh, good, dear. man. Okay. Well, let's snot our way through. Uh, I want to start with uh, with a Who Scored tweet that I see that you have retweeted, Ahmed, which says, uh, Since Gary O'Neill took over as Bournemouth boss on a caretaker basis, uh, only Manchester City, Tottenham and Arsenal have claimed more points than the Cherries. So the first question, I suppose, is uh, why hasn't he been given the job permanently yet? Uh, that's a good question. I'd probably say it would have a lot to do with the fact that Bournemouth will probably have a new owner quite soon, a new ambitious owner. And um, my understanding is that Bournemouth would probably prefer to make an external appointment. Um, they're used to making sort of uh, uh, interim or uh, making interim managers permanent. They did it with Jonathan Woodgate a couple of seasons back. But that was only because they had Scott Parker, who was at Fulham at the time, in the waiting in the wings. And they knew that he would go to pot with Fulham at the end of the season. And then they could just sort of grab him at the end of the season. That's why Woodgate went towards the end. So I think this season they haven't really got a manager waiting in the wings. They've got a short list, which... They're constantly tweaking and, and um, the, the prospective owner, Bill Foley, is constantly being kept abreast of. But yeah, I think because O'Neill is doing a very good job, I, I think that must be stated, of course. But like, he's still very new at this managerial thing. Um, this is his first real sort of head coach role. He started out as a, as a member of Jonathan Woodgate's coaching staff, then stayed on with Scott Parker. Um, so this is the first time he's actually the main man in the hot seat in the dugout. So uh, yeah, I think it might come a bit too soon for him, this ball of world. Mm, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll come to the takeover in a second. Uh, but Seb, you had a conversation with Ahmed over the weekend, didn't you? Would you like to uh, talk about that and ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Joe. I obviously um, I've watched my fair bit of Bournemouth highlights, Ahmed. But what's actually changed within the defending, like it, within the detail of it, beyond it just being better? Um, I think Bournemouth are a lot more sort of proactive in their defensive actions. Um, they were quite reactive uh, under Parker. They definitely sat back a lot. Uh, there is Bournemouth Press, obviously, as one of the best teams in the championship last season. They uh, had a lot of the ball. Um, and so when they did lose it, they counter pressed. They were a heavy sort of pressing from the front team. And we've seen, we're, we're starting to see uh, glimpses of that coming back. Actually, in the, in the Fulham game at the weekend, Bournemouth were pressing probably at their most intensely as we've seen them all season. Uh, we saw sort of Lewis Cook, who was one of the holding midfielders, further forward than Ryan Christie, who was uh, playing at left wing or right wing rather. Uh, trying to steal the ball of Tom Kearney and, and Giapalina Jap- when they were playing out the back. So, yeah, I guess they're definitely a lot more intense in their defensive actions just when they're sort of pressing from the front, when they're trying to squeeze opponents sort of against the touchline, trying to win uh, win the ball in that way. Uh, it, but it's also quite difficult to compare Bournemouth's performances, particularly in, in a defensive perspective, uh, when you're looking at Parker and O'Neill, because Parker had four games this season. Three of them were against Man City, Liverpool and Arsenal. Um, and so, yeah, that, 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 those are quite restrictive games to, to, to sort of play against. So a lot of the noises that came out of Bournemouth earlier this season, I mean, until Scott Parker departed the club, he talked very openly about not being able to compete and not being able to, uh, yeah, not being able to spend in the way that he might have wished to on, on like returning to the Premier League. One of the, the one of the differences seems to be that you no longer have a manager, at least from a media perspective, you no longer have a manager who's kind of inadvertently denigrating your abilities in public in front of <laughs> in front of the press. Like, is that something to read into? Is that something that um, is a sort of evidence of growing self belief or uh, you know, more of a kind of a, a communal collegiate um, um, attitude within the squad? Yeah, I think that's definitely been a factor, uh, probably something that's a bit difficult to ignore. Um, the players that I speak to on the record and off the record assert that um, while Parker said what he said in front of the media and maybe didn't paint the players in the best light or didn't really represent them in the way they might have liked to, he was when he was with them, without the cameras involved, he was he was top with them and he, he, he sort of he maintained the level of professionalism that you would expect with them. Um, so and they were quite surprised to hear that he was sacked. Um, so yeah, you can read into that what you will, but um, yeah, I think O'Neill has kind of cleared up a lot of that mess. Uh, and immediately when he was interim, his first press conference asserted that he kind of disagreed with what Parker was saying in the sense that he don't think this plays, he doesn't think this plays are good enough. He definitely feels like these players are ready, uh, and he's 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 uh, you, you get the sense that he's almost proud 
to, to, to be even as an interim. He knows that he's probably not going to get the job full time. But, you know, he, he, there's, there is that sort of um, collective spirit that he's fostered that you, that you touched on there. That he's definitely sort of had to sort of spruce back up again because going 9-0 down to Liverpool in the way that they did, hearing what your manager says, like player confidence has got to be rock bottom. That's got to be some of the most some of the most damaging things you could say as a, as a manager, really. Um, yeah. And you can you can see that in the way that Bournemouth handled the decision to sack him so quickly afterwards. So, yeah, I, I think O'Neill's done a really good job there as well. Was that harsh with Parker? Because he must not have been able to sh- to make his team play the way he wanted to at the start of the season. They beat Villa at the start of the season, right? That was the first game, I think. And then, what's it? Arsenal, City and Liverpool. Mm. I mean, that's kind of hard. Yeah. Rule. Wasn't, wasn't the ar- ar- argument around that, though, that it was less about the results and it was more about what he was saying? He was saying, yeah. he was yeah. saying like, but, we can't win. But, and, I mean, and, and, but, but you, you can't them. against City and you, like, Liverpool no, no, doing sure. you 9-0. You would think, I mean, maybe... Did he change his approach an awful lot from what was working so well in the Championship for those games specifically? Was the Villa game, did he play very much like the first... Well, sorry, like last season in the Championship and then had to change it for those three games to try and to contain what they just couldn't do because he didn't have the players to do that? And he knew that trying to press up high would be like really dangerous. Yeah, so last season they played a very attacking 4-3-3. Uh, the two attacking number eights, much like Manchester City, would uh, make a front five. So it would be like a 2-3-5 at times. They'd have a lot of the ball uh, counter-pressing in that way. A lot of similarities with Pep City. Um, but this season, you know, completely different. A 5-3-2. Parker always wanted to go five at the back um, in a similar way to what he did with Fulham when they were promoted as well. And with that, he wanted more defenders. I think they started the season with just three centre-backs, two of which, Chris Meppham and James Hill, um, weren't really even starters in the championship. And to rely on mm. them in the Premier League was go- always going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a struggle. So, yeah, and at, but at the same time, you know, that when, he, when, when Parker made those comments after the Liverpool game, that was not the first time he'd done that. He did that in pre-season. He did that um, a couple of times during pre-season, actually. And he was told, my understanding is that he was told from the higher ups, like, look, we, we get that the situation isn't great. We get the results aren't going your way. And we get that it's difficult to go out in front of the cameras after results like that and have to justify and answer those hard questions. But we, uh, it wasn't public knowledge at the time, but the club was under, the club was going through a sale. And when your manager is saying that, um, you know, I don't know how long we're going to last in the Premier League for, and Bournemouth are looking to cash in on their Premier League status when selling the club, that's not exactly what you want to be hit. That's not what we want to be hearing. So it's, yeah, it's, it's something he was definitely warned about, uh, but it's not really something that he felt like he could keep. Uh, it, was, it, it probably felt like conditions that he felt were, were, were sort of beyond him. Um, but I guess Gary O'Neill was kind of, uh, yeah, proved him wrong in that, in that respect, hasn't he? He's, a, he's certainly a company man. John, what, what is it that you like about Bournemouth this season? Can I talk about what I don't like about Bournemouth? You, you can. You, you p- continue to, so you ask, to, yeah. continue to, to be my authority, yeah. don't you? You yeah. continue to... No, oh, here comes John McKenzie to say something boring. Oh. <laughs> here we go. Come on, John. Have you been practising your yeah. voice of the crowd's voice? Yeah. Man of the people. Yeah. Uh, no, my, my point is simply going to be, it looks as though since the 9-0 loss... Bournemouth have been wildly overperforming their numbers. Uh, like looking at the uh, looking at the expected goals for and against, it seems as though every result they've had since then has gone lucky for them. Um, so they've got draws when they should have lost, and they've won when they should have drawn, and things like that. He's trying to contextualise it again. So, Ahmed, does this ring true to you? <laughs> Fairly, yeah, I do get what you're saying. I've had a look at the um, the XG numbers, particularly in that Nottingham Forest game. Um, the, the XG Bournemouth had to score three goals was nowhere near like you saw Philip Billings cracker from like 30 yards Dominic Solanke's overhead kick in a very congested box um and I think Jaden Anthony's winner was probably the only clear-cut chance they created in that game so yeah I guess you could definitely say that then I guess that probably goes back into the whole new manager bounce sort of thing players playing confidently taking chances that they probably wouldn't have done under Parker with the the whole the environment being a little bit quite miserable when he was manager there so yeah I I guess you could, that's probably one explanation as to why they're overperforming the numbers. But I wouldn't say they're lucky. Hmm. In fact, if you if you ask most Bournemouth fans, they'd say that quite a few VAR decisions have gone against them. Um, so yeah, take that, take that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence, and Rafa Honigstein. There are journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.